Just doing a quick check-in. Um, I'm still on my road trip. I'm over in Vermont. Um, and I don't know, maybe you can see there's some snowy roofs outside. It's very, very picturesque, quaint New England church steeples and hills and, um, you know, there evidently there was like a bunch of snow that came the last few days. Um, so I've been over in upstate New York and then yesterday I gro drove up through the Adirondacks um, across upstate New York into Vermont and I was in Burlington and now I'm in Montpelier and uh, tomorrow I'm going to be staying with some folks. I didn't realize that uh, when I couldn't go to Arkansas because of the um, uh, solar eclipse that the eclipse is in other places too. So evidently Montpelier, Vermont is also in the totality section um, and is supposed to be very, very busy tomorrow or Monday. Um, so I, uh, I'm, I'm moving a little bit further out, but uh, it'll be interesting. I don't know. It's been cloudy and rainy for the past five days. So I'm a little skeptical that there'll even be really all that much to see other than darkness. Um, but we shall see if it clears out. Uh, tomorrow um, and Monday. So anyway, just by way of an update, I wanted to give this quick um, sort of just account for where I am because I anticipate the next month is going to be really hectic for me. And while I did a lot of documentation and I took a lot of photos, um, it may be a bit before I'm able to um, consolidate it all and present it in a more formal way. Um, but for everyone who is wishing me well with my transition with the house and everything, it actually did work out well. And um, we got multiple offers um, on the very first day, which was April Fool's Day. So that was actually perfect. Um, and as you know, this is my only house I've ever owned. And the idea and you know, I'm very much, you know, I designed aspects of the house and we took care of the house and so to sort of put it out into the public view for other people to sort of critique and judge it was very unnerving um and especially in this day where everything is like house flip city and everything is luxury and modern and marble and blah 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 and my house isn't that my house is very um we it has most of the original many of the original features not the kitchen and the bath but many original features um from the 1880s and um i didn't know how that would go in like this modern AI era, but evidently um, a lot of people liked it. And so I said, it's sort of like putting your kid up in front of a bunch of pageant judges and standing back and like waiting to see what they say. But um, anyway, in this tech forward world, evidently there are still a lot of people who appreciate um, old things um, in my, including my house. Uh, so yeah, so on to the next phase, because I really wasn't able to do that until we could sort of shut things down with the house and shut things down with the marriage and then move on um, to the next thing. Um, so yeah, so the next coming month, I'm going to be working on figuring out how to drive you haul trucks up and down between Philadelphia and Arkansas. I'm not going to get a really big one. So I'm going to have to make several trips, I think. Um, but yeah, so that is, uh, that is what is on my plate for the coming month until hopefully I'll probably get like like a month to month rental um, down there and see what there is to be seen in terms of a new place. So anyway, thank you very much for everybody who sent positive um, energy my way. And um, it's not totally resolved, but it was a, it was a cash offer. And um, so we're just proceeding down until closing in early May. And it was, so I guess all things considered, it was about as um, painless and quick as it could be. Um, even though I'm really sad, you know, I'm, I'm still really sad about, um, but it's time. I'll make a new beginning. Uh, so thank you. And so anyway, I just wanted to hit a few highlights of the trip so far. So I went up to Syracuse. I knew some people up there who had invited me for a talk I gave, gave I think, in the fall of 20... 21 or 22. It was when the graphene stuff was first starting and Steffers and I were first starting to talk about that. Um, and so we, and evidently Syracuse is one of these like New York State's very innovative smart cities. They're doing a lot of smart city infrastructure, smart city policy making. And um, in the suburbs around, and again, Syracuse University is there. Um, Micron is a new semiconductor company that's got a lot of state money or anticipating a lot of money from the state of New York. Um, and so that's what they need for all of this new spatial computing infrastructure. Um, 
so I didn't see a whole lot of evidence of all the smart city. And that's the thing that's kind of tricky is like you can look around and it just all looks normal. Um, but Syracuse is sort of in the center of that. And um, so we did a day trip out to Oneida, um, which is this early 19th century utopian community. Um, actually, one of the first communities that was doing eugenics. They called it stirpiculture, and this guy, uh, Noise, he he anticipated that, he said that uh, Christ's second coming had already happened, but they were just waiting for people to be perfect. So essentially, it was this communal program of um, free love and open polyamorous relationships, um, and but men were supposed to be in charge of, like, controlling themselves, and um, so it was only certain people were supposed to procreate uh, for the good of the community. And so they called themselves, like, Bible communists, and uh, they were looking at, like, primitive Christianity, and part of the... Um, they had their own communal industries, and initially, like, one of the biggest industries was making animal traps, which was kind of a strange thing. <laughs> so animal traps, and then eventually um, the c collective sort of turned into a corporation, like an early benefit corporation. And then they started the Oneida Silverware Company, which I think went bankrupt in like 2007 and reconstituted as something else. Um, but I have Oneida flatware. Um, I got it for my wedding and it's actually, whole, it's very nice uh, flatware, but it has this very, very interesting history. So the building, um, essentially it's like a hive and it was 93,000 square feet, 300 people lived there. Um, the children who were born, which were like stirpicults or something like that, they had a certain name. Uh, as soon as they were weaned, they were taken away to the children's wing and raised, and that's sort of the whole um, Walden to B.F. Skinner kind of thing. And even the sort of free love polyamory kind of, um, but with no commitment, in fact, like really undermining the idea of like relational um, monogamy or uh, that one would be preferenced over the other definitely came out of that, um, reminded me of the Ye Ye Yevgeny Zamyatin's book, We, um, in which... Again, there were no relationships and everyone had to just sort of have relations with anyone else based on if you had a ticket request. <laughs> um, and so it was just really interesting to go back and sort of see um, the collectivist aspect. You could call it collectivist, you could call it socialist, communist, communitarian, hive mind, um, but that ultimately it all morphed into like this benefit corporation model with the Oneida Silverware Company. And then tomorrow on my way out to out of town, I'm going to be stopping by, I think at Watertown, Vermont, water or something, um, where Ben and Jerry's is. And um, of course, Ben and Jerry's was the first benefit corporation. And so all of the social impact is linked to sort of the moral economy and the hive mind. So we had a great day there. A lot of beautiful trees. I made a lovely heart at the base of this big tree. There was a giant, like, I think it maybe was a tulip poplar. It was, you know, like 30 feet around on the trunk. So we all hugged the trees and we all got wet in the rain because that was the first day of pouring, pouring rain. And we were just pretty much wet the whole time. <laughs> and so then the next day, we did a day trip up to Palmyra, New York, uh, which was maybe about an hour or so um, west, uh, sort of northwest of Syracuse. And that is where Joseph Smith had his visions um, that were connected to this burned over district and re religious revivalism that were the origins of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Oh, I forgot to mention. So in the Oneida community, they had this great library. Um, and they had the mixed up file of Mrs. Basley Frankenweiler and Harriet the Spy in the library, in the children's section. But they also had a much older section of older books behind glass cabinets, these beautiful glass cabinets. And there was whole sections on spiritualism, uh, primitive Christianity, mesmerism, animal magnetism, channeling. So all of this stuff that I'm talking about with like the, the direct access to the field, like through mystical experience totally woven into Oneida, and then overlapping with um, the uh, Joseph Smith's sacred grove in Palmyra. So he had actually been born, his family was from Vermont, and then they relocated to better farming land um, in the Palmyra area. And at the time, he was, uh, it was during this period where there was a lot of religious fervor and different faith Protestant faiths competing against one another for, for you know, um, 
people to join their team, you know, and uh, Joseph Smith was praying to God in the sacred grove to ask for guidance on what was the right path. And ultimately it was like, well, there's actually this other revelation and you should find these golden tablets up on the hill. And we went to the hill. Uh, I didn't realize it was two different um, visions. Uh, the Angel Moroni came later and said that the tablets were up on on the the the, the hill. Um, and but yeah, very interesting. And again, so we we got a good tour both places, and um, we placed hearts um, in both places. And pouring down rain, pouring down rain. So I'm just gonna take this like rain and snow and sleet and water and lakes and um, Great Lakes and Lake Champlain and all these different water bodies of water. Winooski River um, as this idea of maybe the, the cleansing, the cleansing of the, the old ways, not that they were bad, but just cleansing and preparing the way for the new path for me. But it was a little uncomfortable because it was a cold, steady rain. Um, and so we were going through the sacred grove and um, w as we made our way around, uh, we looked down and there was this beautiful carpet of green. And I was like, oh, I wonder if those are maybe wild orchids or trout lilies. And so I went down and I saw the leaves of the trout lilies, which were very tiny. They weren't ready to be blooming yet, uh, but they're little green leaves with red speckles on them. Uh, but the green carpet, we realized later, were actually ramps. And it's interesting because if you look up ramps, I think they're related to allium and onions. And um, they were an early spring tonic early spring food for indigenous people and other people. And I guess there are other parts of the world because the Grimm's fairy tale, Rapunzel, where the pregnant wife sends her husband over the garden wall of the witch to get, she was having a craving. Um, it was for ramps and rampion is what Rapunzel stands for rampion. Um, so that's a really interesting connection there. So beautiful carpet of ramps and you know, my hearts that I were was making, my, my friend Juliana, had. I still had a bag of things that she had brought, but I'm a little slim pickings, right, because I've been giving away and making hearts in preparation for, you know, leaving Philadelphia. And so everything, it's very brown, right, this time of year. It's up here in the north. There's not a lot of green. Um, but some of the people that we were visiting with, there was um, a... a a boy who was working on felting and he felted us all little hearts. So I had a red felted heart and I laid it down in among at the base of the ramps. There was a, a rocky, a, a rock outcropping with beautiful green moss. So we put the red heart on the moss and surrounded it with sand that Juliana had given me from Brighton Beach and um, feathers that she had brought. And we, I, met, I set a lovely intention there, but there was water just everywhere pouring through. Um, and this whole area in the Burnover District was also along the Erie Canal. And Sean had sort of pointed out this idea of, uh, you know, commerce and transit and also the commerce of ideas and energetic ideas, right? So Palmyra um, was also like on the Erie Canal. And so uh, water pouring out and my friend pointed out like, oh, this is actually a spring because there's nothing above it. It's not just a culvert that's channeling a spring above it. This is gushing right out of the side of the hill. So it was this beautiful primary water, sacred water and um, the moss and the ramps and the heart there. So we, we, you know. Anyway, we got back, we were a little bit soggy and then we parted ways and I went on to Rochester. And I've been very interested in Rochester, as I mentioned before, because of Mark Tucker and the National Center on Education and the Economy and how that fits with workforce aligned education and competency based education and ultimately digital twinning. Um, and of course, at the time I was doing my education work, I was just like, I don't, what's up with Rochester? I don't get it. Um, but Rochester was one of these cities of LRNG, like Dallas and San Diego and Philly, but these high tech cities. And but it wasn't that it wasn't just about that. It had this much older history. Um, and so this history goes back to optics and ultimately um, prisms and copying and glass. And so we've got Bausch and Lohm, who uh, were in the 1850s, they started an optical business, but not just eyeglasses, but also military optics. And then um, uh, Xerox, right, which is Xerox and Kodak, both of which are sort of like twinning, right? Like making representation of things in a virtual medium, right? And so I, as I'm doing this, I've been reading this book. I think Sean mentioned it to me or somebody about um, 
the secret of the golden flower. Um, it's a translation of the, this Eastern practice about sort of meditative Taoist alchemy. And uh, this guy, uh, Wilhelm, Richard Wilhelm translated it. And then Jung wrote the introduction. Um, and it's like on Chinese meditation. And you can kind of see that. And so I really think that rather than not that it's not at all about the Abrahamic religions, but I think a lot of the apocalyptic Abrahamic religion focus is to take people's attention away from the Eastern and Islamic mystical practices there, because I think it's 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 sort of interfacing both East and West. Um, so anyway, so I had been reading about this, and part of it, they talk about the idea of a, a spiritual body, and through sort of mental discipline and, and, and practice with your biology that you can build up your spiritual body for the time at which you no longer need your physical body um, and you go back into, you know, the other space, right? This other sacred space. And so to me, I keep thinking that, that and it's all about light. It's all about the light. Um, that the optics and photonics and copying and digital twinning may almost be like the digital twin, some sort of parody of this um, crystalline, sp crystallized light spiritual body, only they're attempting to make it with these emerging technologies and soul bound tokens and game mechanics. Um, so in Rochester, um, the first day I went to the Rochester Institute of Technology and their magic spell lab with all the video gaming. And I, I put a heart there in front of this uh, art installation that was about a quilt, but it was all rainbow colors and squares, uh, but all made out of wood. So it was sort of this pillar that was called a quilt. So I, I, I placed, and um, a friend and I, we had walked in a park in their neighborhood in Syracuse, and I didn't realize that the larch was also called tamarack, but there were a lot of these larch trees. And so the larch is a uh, needled tree, but it's deciduous and it drops its needles. So it's one of those kind of interesting trees and they have beautifully delicate little um, pine, well, not, I guess they're not pine cones, but cones, um, seed cones. And the, often they break off on the branches and there are lots of them. And so we gathered a bunch of those. So I, that heart, I used um, the, the cones from the tamarack or the, the large trees that I had gotten in Syracuse. And uh, again, pouring down rain, lots and lots of rain. So these hearts, I'll, I'll put a link. I'll maybe like, I'll include a link to this video in a blog post and then I'll show you all the hearts that I made. Um, so yeah, but that was, it was a lot of rain. Um, and, and interestingly enough, Rochester Institute of Technology, which is south of the city and was purpose, well, it, it dated to the 19th century, but then, um, uh, there was they were going to run a highway through the city the way they did in the 60s, and they relocated it. So this whole campus was brand new as of the 60s, uh, south of town. And it was also a center for deaf education and technology, which is very interesting when we start to think about the whole audio, the audio aspect um, of everything. Uh, and then afterwards, I went to, I drove into town, um, and the Fox sisters are sort of these early pioneers of spiritualism. And I had wanted to go to uh, the cottage where these two sisters um, were communicating with essentially the spirit of a man who had been murdered in the house. He was a peddler, and he had been murdered, I guess, for the things he was selling and buried in the basement. And then the the, the, the two girls were like he was disrupted. It was a poltergeist situation. And then they became um, taken under their wing by these uh, Quakers and essentially birthed the spiritualist movement, which is still very active. Hugely, hugely important in the late 19th, early 20th century. Many spiritualist churches and many of these spiritualist churches would have camps and retreats that would go on for weeks in the summer. And like John Fetzer, one of them was outside of Indianapolis and he was um, a, a regular attendee and they would do like seances and channeling and all of this stuff. So um, the Plymouth Street Church um, had an obelisk to the Fox sisters and it was actually paid for by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle of the Sherlock Holmes uh, books. And he was a member of the Society for Psychical Research in the UK. And evidently he came to Rochester and he attended this Plymouth church, spirituals church um, at one point, and he decided to pay for this obelisk. So the church also got demolished with the interstate and relocated, but the obelisk just got moved. And so I made 
I set another acorn intention by uh, the Fox Sisters obelisk. And then later on the way over back to Burlington, I did stop in, it's like Hydesville, New York, but it's north of Newburgh, I think. Um, and they actually have the foundation of the cottage. It burned multiple times, but they had a foundation and they put a little house over it and they had displays and you could sort of peer in the windows and look in at the foundation. So, um, and there I made a heart that was um, made out of, they're not actually walnuts, maybe hickory nuts. They, they had big husks like walnuts, but um, when you split them open, they had like the little owl kind of faces. Um, so I made a a, a heart out of those nuts um, there. Again, lots of brown <laughs> because there's not a lot green growing right now. Um, so yeah, so we did the Fox, I did the Fox sisters. Um, and then I ended up spending unexpectedly like four hours at this museum called the Strong Museum, which was the National Museum of Play. And this woman, um, she collected toys and she had a big trust fund. Her father was a major investor in Kodak. And um, so she had all this money and she collected toys among other things. And in the 80s, they built a toy museum. And it, it was fascinating for me because actually my first grown up job um, when I got out of college was as a curatorial assistant at Please Touch Museum in Philadelphia, which was a hands on children's museum of the kind that the Strong Museum is, only this one was way more over the top than the Please Touch Museum that I was at at the time. Um, but on the second floor of this museum was the Video Game Hall of Fame and a whole section that was a tutorial about leveling up in digital worlds and essentially walking people through sort of the basics of video game design. Um, and you had to get a, a like a, a wristband with a QR code to play the games. Now, I didn't get that. And I watched how other people were playing it, but immersive reality gaming and they would, you know, I took so many photos, I can't even tell you, like it filled up the storage on my phone. Um, but they were talking about labyrinths and jumping and pop symbology and problem solving. And um, I don't know, Emily Moyer, if you're listening, it was really interesting. The displays um, in this area, each of the units of learning were... Um, essentially, they had like a chemistry chart, like a the, all of them, like in a... I don't even know. I'm not good at chemistry, but whatever the chart of all of the different elements um, like you would have in chemistry, they had for badges for things to learn about video game design. So and I know um, you guys have been looking into the idea of um, chemistry as sort of interdimensional manifestation or like pulling information from the field into reality. So that was really compelling to me that they were representing these units of knowledge in video game, the video game concept as elements in like the chemistry chart, you know, the atomic elements. I don't know, I'm terrible about that. Whatever that chart is, like molecules and minerals and elements, yeah, that thing. Um, and they had a whole wall with Game of Life citing Marshall McLuhan, uh, you know, the medium is the message, and it had all of the cellular automata and uh, the Conway's Game of Life, and people were playing it, and I'm sure they had no idea what it was really about. Um, so yeah, so I spent four hours there. I made a beautiful heart outside. There was this round portal with a bridge um, and sort of the Ouroboros and the Zen swooshy circles. And I made a, a nice yellow little heart with some dropped flowers of this Cornelian cherry that was in bloom. So bright yellow, that was really nice. Um, and let's see, after that, where did I go? I think that was maybe... Oh, there was a local park. There was a, a park with a lot of acoustics and butterflies and strange things. And there was a black vinyl belt on the ground. So I made sort of a, a slightly pretty unattractive black heart there because it was what I had. And um, yeah, oh, I went to the Eastman, the George Eastman Mansion, which is a, a, a museum of photography. I didn't go in because I was running out of time. But there was a beautiful garden courtyard with an astrolabe and a fountain. And uh, so I made a heart there that was all out of wisteria pods and the beans from wisteria under the arbor. And uh, I took a picture of this big colorama display that Kodak had from the 50s. And so I think there is definitely something about Maya and the Grand Illusion and imagery and Kodak. And um, oh, the first night I was there, again, dark, a dark and stormy night, right? And I was driving around because I want—I didn't have time to see a lot, but I wanted to see the Rochester, the strong um, 
hospital in Rochester, which was connected to the University of Rochester. And that was one of the first Flexner hospitals and one of the first hospitals to have an integrated psychiatric unit. Um, so that was very interesting. And then during the Manhattan Project, that's where they were doing the um, really reprehensible like exposure to radioactive isotopes. And they were doing it to people against they, without their consent, without their knowledge um, in that hospital system. And that was uh, Stafford Warren was part of that. And then I think later there was a big, huge, like one of the largest mental health institutions um, in the US that operated from the 50s through the 90s. It was like a 15 story tall building that's now abandoned. And so I drove by and it's like this hulking behemoth building like with no lights on in and it was it was a very scary building. So um, I did take some pictures of the strong hospital from the outside. Um, I didn't set any hearts there. I didn't have, have the capacity to do that. And um, let's see, what else did I do? Is that all I did? Oh, I did go by the Xerox building and the Bausch and Loam headquarters. I didn't have time because I, I ran out of time to make hearts at those two places. But the Xerox building, very important to know about Xerox Park, um, which was in uh, this the um, Silicon Valley and developed many of the early uh, computing system infrastructure tools. And now uh, Xerox Park, P-A-R-C, uh, was just turned over to SRI. So that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, and let's see, Bausch and Loam and Xerox. And I think that was, oh, I did go out to Lake Ontario and there was this strange peace park out there on land donated by Eastman. And when I got out there, the peace sign, which was laid out on the ground in sort of a garden was all set up in rainbow colors and like photonics. So I, I set a heart there too. Oh, and on the way, I stopped by the Seneca Park Zoo, which is really kind of a rinky dink zoo. But if you look up the IXO Foundation, they were a partner with IXO Blockchain on conservation impact programs. Um, so I just wanted to go see what the Seneca Park Zoo was like. And my friend Sean said, Oh, you better check out and see if there are any naked mole rats because those are the one mammal that's our youth social that live in colonies. And of course, the zoo was closed by the time I got there. But, um, um, they do have two colonies of naked mole rats there at the Seneca Park Zoo, and it's part of this Olmstead-designed park. Um, yeah, and and the people that I see, I had a room like Airbnb room, and the the people were involved in like uh, you know an herbalist and apothecary work uh, in some ecstatic dance. So they, we, you know, I was explaining to them all of the background. They'd only been in Rochester for seven years and they didn't know any of this stuff about the photonics. Oh, I did go by the University of Rochester and I did take a picture at the engineering building of engineering and optics. And, you know, Steffers has done like a lot, a lot of work on nanophotonics and Rochester, but I just couldn't unpack it all. There was just so much to do. Um, so yeah, so I drove back through, drove across New York, stopped in at the Fox Sisters, the site of their cottage and their poltergeist experience, drove through beautiful Adirondacks. Um, there's not a lot of gas stations on that road. It was, I was a little unnerved, but it was snow squalls the whole way through, but the, the roads were clear. So good on New York and Vermont. Like I'm not used to doing, a, I have my little Subaru, but I'm not a real seasoned snow driver. So um, made my way across and um, was in Burlington. And then today, this morning, before I left, I stopped at uh, the office of the guy who helped uh, Michael Levin develop the Xenobots, you know, out of the, the living robots made out of the frog eggs, because that's something they were doing here in Vermont with their supercomputer. And, uh, yeah. Oh, and uh, when I got there to the building that on um, now, it might not have been his office. One place said it was his office and then one place said his office was in a different building. It was this Farrell building, um, F-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. Uh, but when I got to the Farrell building, it was all about environmental studies and the Gund Foundation and all the hexagons, all the sustainability, all of the diversity and equity, all of the partnership stuff, because there's nothing greener than you know, using electricity and fitness landscapes and supercomputing to model frog cells into Pac-Man living robots, right? Couldn't, couldn't ever be anything wrong with that. That's just green, right? And I'm, I'm realizing um, just now that I'm in Vermont that, you know, I've talked with this a little bit um, 
with some folks, but this idea of the populism of Vermont, both progressive and more conservative, is really suited to the super super organism. This idea of participatory voting and the town hall meetings and the independent minded. Um, so I really feel like Vermont is being set up because again, it's rural, it's out of the way, it's you know, there's not, there's quite a bit of poverty, like people are looking to take advantage of any economic opportunities. Um, and so this consensus token stuff will work out really well here. And they have this long history of working in sustainability. Again, Ben and Jerry is one of the first benefit corporations, you know, right here in Vermont. Uh, but one of the friends that I was with um, in Syracuse brought up the idea of like the Hermes trigemistus like the, 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 you know, the hermetic, the hermetic stuff and these emerald tablets. Um, actually, someone else had mentioned the emerald tablets and I had never heard of the Hermes emerald tablet. But now I'm starting to realize that the green, like all of this stuff with green, like why green is important. And it may be the Emerald Gate Foundation is a reference to the emerald in classical antiquities and these mystery school orders. Um, so, oh, I forgot one more thing. So on the drive over, I got routed through Rome, New York. Now, the thing about upstate New York is that many of these towns, my friends were explaining that during the Revolutionary War, uh, officers in the in the Revolutionary Army afterwards were paid in land because the government didn't have any money. Now, this land was just like chunks of forest that were largely inaccessible because there were no roads and there was no infrastructure. So they weren't really very valuable. And a lot of the soldiers, their families had built up debts while they were away at the stores and different things. So they would sell this land to developers uh, to get a little bit of money to pay off their debts. And so then these, uh, all of these tracts of land that were inherently military-based, gridded units, were de then redeveloped at, as classical antiquity. So many of the names in upstate New York are named after, you know, uh, thinkers and leaders and places in in Greece and Rome. And so and, and Rome is one of them. And Rome is a highly had a big Air Force base, the Griffiths um, Air Force Base or Griffiths, G-R-I-F-F. ISS. And it was working in all sorts of frequency and electro electronic warfare kind of stuff back in the day. But then it was closed, mostly, not quite. And then now is being redeveloped as a public-private partnership with all of the defense tech. So, you know, as I'm routed through Rome, and again, we're thinking Rome, like arch archetypal imprints, right? The, the, these you know, it's not the Athenian city-states, but it's the empire, the empire mindset, and empire through frequency. And I'm driving through, and I see this business park that I've researched, like, a number of years before. And I'm like, okay, let me pull over and make sure it's the same thing. So I'm pulling over, and I see it's the same thing. And then I notice that they have a sculpture park. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I totally have to go see this sculpture park in the former Air Force Base Public-Private Partnership Defense quantum nano research center. So I'm driving all the way through and I see that there's like the Eastern Defense Force. So they've still got the military enclosures. I see BAE, I see um, Bo Booz Allen Hamilton, I see Lockheed, I'm seeing all the things. I'm seeing this thing called like Innovade, which they're doing quantum, high level quantum and nano stuff. And they're with the Gryphus Institute, which their symbol is a griffin. So we're back to archetypes. And it's an origami griffin because, again, origami is what they're using in the self-assembling nanoparticles. So I'm bumping around. I can't find the sculpture park. Finally, I get to the sculpture park and then I can't find a place to pull over. And then finally, I find a place to pull over. So as I'm going around the traffic circle to get to the place to pull over, in the middle of the traffic circle is this crazy chrome pegasus with this swooshy, swirly arrow coming out, all in like silver. And it's like, moving forward is the, the, the quote. So they're totally imprinting with this sculpture in the middle of this crazy, and they're stack and pack housing all over the place. So they're, you know, redeveloping it as own community with like defense tech and emerging tech and, 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 and then the sculpture park is overlaid with a disc golf course, which is very strange. So disc golf. And, and there's a big electrical substation right there. So I pull over into the parking lot by the electrical substation. And I'm there's a bunch of pine cones on the ground. So I'm like, okay, I see you. So I pick up 12 pine cones and put them in my bag. And, um, and I'm scouting it out. The first giant sculpture is Freya, 
who is the Norse goddess of fate. <laughs> and I've, I've researched Freya as part of this Maniac TV series. So I'm like, oh my gosh. And on the way, walking over, and it's very squishy. Again, pouring rain. Again, lots of water. And I'm walking through the squishy, squishy, muddy grass. And on the ground is a trapezoidal silver sticker for Alcoa. And it looks like it's a vintage sticker from the 70s, like the Alcoa logo from the 70s. I'm like, how did this get into the time frame? So I pick it up and then I make the heart, you know, with these pine cones around Freya and put the Alcoa sticker in the middle of it. And I keep walking. And then the next sculpture is um, the birth of Venus. And it's all of these like frog egg things. Okay, interesting. Then there's like a typical big helicopter thing with an Agent Orange memorial, which is very sad. Um, and then I keep going, and then there's a Persephone monument. So again, we've got the Persephone. And then I keep going, and then there's a green column, a green column of tile, um, which is, again, we've got, we're back to the green. And then I see the um, the Pegasus with the swooshy thing. Um, and then I, I keep going, and then there's a yellow sculpture that doesn't have a name, but it looks like a trap, like one of those Oneida community, like, spring-loaded traps. Um, so anyway, so that was Gryphus. You guys should look that up, because that's that's definitely a thing. Um, they were doing a lot of occulted imprinting there. Um, and yeah, so I just made my way. Beautiful scenery through the Adirondacks. Um, total immersion in beautiful nature. Um, so snow squalls, but you know, it was not not too scary other than like the fact that I was worried I didn't, was going to run out of gas, but I didn't. Um, and uh, yeah. And so then I got into Burlington and had dinner with some friends who follow my work, which was super nice this morning, stopped at the, um, the Xenobot Center as best I could tell. I don't think it was like the office of the guy with the Xenobot Center. Um, and, uh, so that heart, what did I do with that one? I um, I used, I, I punched down in the snow because there's more snow in Vermont and I put all the larch cones and then um, my one of my friends made me some lovely origami. So I left one of the origami pieces with a lichen uh, stick and some buds, some early like daylily stalks are coming up and a few buds. And um, on the snow, I sprinkled a bit of the, the sandy shells from Brighton Beach that Juliana had given to me. And I pressed in these beautiful like hydrangea flowers, like stars around the edge. And I had some yew and some milkweed pods around the outside. And that was really nice. And um, yeah, and then just looking at this gun family that's all connected to the environmentalism, um, but also diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, and human capital, and early childhood. So it's all the impact stuff. And this Gund family, when I look back at Little Sis and the Gund Foundation, I had entered tons of stuff on Gund a long, long time ago. So they're definitely in the mix there. Um, and... So I think, I think we're getting done. Like, so Montpelier, I have to go back and look. Um, when Brandy and Leo and I were doing some research into sustainability work in Southern Florida, it like looped back to up into Vermont. And there's this Nature Conservancy office and the Sustainability Institute that's like a stone's throw from here. So I think I'll stop by there on my way out of town. And again, stop at Ben and Jerry's, the, the, one of the first be benefit corporations, because again, with Vermont, you're thinking, again, super organism, town hall meetings, add some tokens, populism, free agents, right? Democracy, don't tread on me, is sort of, again, um, role-playing games in the simulation modeling. And then we've got these big cooperatives, like the dairy cooperatives, like Cabot. And um, so in that... Um, now they're modernizing. Everything is at scale. So the farms, you can't just farm with 90 dairy cows. You need 1,500. So everything is at scale. And then all the cows are smart. And they all have tags and RFID chips and monitors. And they're all, all of their, they're literally being data harvested, right? And I think they're transitioning away from the dairy and then more towards turning these farms, at least in upstate New York, into solar farms. And, and, who knows what kind of negative environmental impacts that's going to have with these electrical fields on, you know, 
all of the things that live in meadows, right? The insects and the soil microbes and all of that, like they're electrifying everything in ways that are not going to be healthy in the name of green sustainability. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that this D Gund Institute is all about. Um, but I think that the cooperative model, again, is going back to the superorganism, and which is a reason why Vermont would be an interesting sandbox for them to play around in, right? With, with the populism, with the democracy, with the idea of cooperatives, um, but now cybernetic cooperatives. And then ultimately, like what they're doing to the cows and the dairy, we're going to be the next ones. And it's going to be us, like not just our biology, but our consciousness is part of this in my opinion, like interdimensional and computer uh, homeostasis game mechanics game. Uh, so I think that's probably like the big overview of the stuff that I've seen um, over the past week. And I'll do a little blog post and I'll put up the pictures of at least the hearts so you can see that the hearts that I left behind. And thanks to Juliana for giving me material and thanks to my friends who took me around in the parks and people who have accompanied me on my uh, trips. And, uh, yeah, it's been a journey. And I guess tomorrow, no, not tomorrow, uh, Monday is the eclipse day. Um, so that'll be a little bit interesting. I guess there was a, a earthquake in Philadelphia while I was gone. So I'm glad my house seems to be okay. It needs to hold up for at least another month or so. And, um, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sad and I'm wistful for, my old life, which I thought was a very good life, but I think fate has said that there's something new on the horizon for me. And I'm, I'm grateful that I had this opportunity to take this trip and meet up with people that I might not meet up with for a while, given the distance, and to see this beautiful part of the country and see the nature and understand the history that these um, awakenings and these energy fields are something that goes long, long back, right? Like back to Rome, back to the Great Awakening. It has to do with water and, oh, I did stop at one of the locks, you know, and again, think about like the smart contracts and consciousness and water and the Erie Canal and the movement of ideas and control of the water systems and domestication of the wild rivers into something that suits commerce and ideas and logic, um, so yeah, so I'm going forth in gratitude and I, I you know, I appreciate everybody who's been walking this road with me because um, it's a very personal journey kind of uncovering these pieces as and seeing how they relate to my own story, really. Um, and it was really weird to be in this strong museum, the Children's Museum. And, you know, it, that part of me, like my that three or four years that I worked at Please Touch Museum, I just hadn't even really thought of that in a long time. And I realized, like, wow, that was actually important. So, um, yeah, you can see. there It's like my childhood flashed before my eyes. Like, Sesame Street wasn't what you thought. The Hardy Boys wasn't what you thought. Harriet the Spy wasn't what you thought. Like, again, not that they're evil. It's just the idea of using the energy and imaginative power of children for problem solving in sort of using books and imagination um, to get there. It, it just was laid it all out. And then that second floor was all about the gaming, right? The, the, the cooperative gaming, you know, in that space. Um, so yeah, lots of things that we need to be thinking about and talking about next. And um, yeah, so if you don't hear from me for a bit, it's because I'm getting my act together and and uh, moving moving my crap around <laughs> and trying to figure out how to do that and all these new things that I'm going to have to step up and figure out how to do for myself next. But I'm 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 confident I can do it. And um, anyway, it's good to know that there's some some people behind me rooting for me in this next. Um, in this next moment. So thanks for listening, everybody. Bye-bye.